Hi everyone, we have a very special guest here. It's Chris from, um, well, it, it's Chris from Chris. Oh, <laughs> okay, no, let me Sir try Chris that again. No, it's Sir, uh, just, Sir Chris. Just Chris Vranos, that's it. Okay, take two. Hi everyone, today we are talking with Chris Vranos, who is an A Scripts superstar. He's also a motion designer and he delves in a lot of different areas. So, Chris, for those of who are watching who don't really know, could you give us like a, a very quick elevator pitch on who you are and what you do? Okay, so these days I'm mostly working on plugins for After Effects. I make the plugin Lockdown and Composite Brush. We've started working in the Unreal Engine. I'm not exactly sure how that's gonna go, but we do have composite brush in the Unreal Engine. Before that, I was a technical director. I'd be on set relatively often supervising VFX shoots and basically handling technical problems for agencies and animation studios. Okay, so how, how did you get your start in the industry? I guess all I've ever really known was animation from the time I was a little kid starting uh, with stop motion with the digital camera and whatever animation programs I could find on the internet. I went to college for a film towards the Sorry, end of it. Can I stop you there? When you're making stop motion films, is that like Lego films or is it plasticine? Yeah, yeah, like, you know, the off-brand Legos, like Mega Bloks. My parents didn't buy Legos, but yes. <laughs> So you were making ghetto brick films instead of actual brick films? Because I got my start making stop motion animated Lego films, but with real Lego. Ah, well, you got me beat there. <laughs> yeah, but basically, yeah, stop motion, whatever, video. Um, we tried to do green, or well, we tried to do blue screen against the side of my house, which was blue back when we were kids and- uh, Oh, free blue screen. Yeah, I think I think animation and visual effects and compositing was really all I ever knew. So that's just where I went for school. So, mm -hmm. yeah. And um, w back in those days, was it a difficult road from school to getting into the industry, or was it? Did you find it pretty easy? It was so long ago that I want to say it wasn't that bad. It wasn't an atypical experience, but I also feel like it did take a couple of years to actually get established and become comfortable. Mm -hmm. I think uh, out of school probably took me a couple of months to get a first job. It's always like a low paying job. And then there was yeah, definitely some job. unemployment in between. And then I found that once I moved to New York City, it was pretty easy to find work. This was maybe maybe a year or two out of school. Right. So where were you before New York City? I was living in Massachusetts, working in Providence, Rhode Island. and. Uh, just taking whatever remote work or for whatever little studios I could find out there. Right, so moving to the big city, the big city was a, a good thing for your career. I think that if you're gonna try to find work in this industry, you really have to be in New York or LA. Right, because they've got all the um, all the the agencies and all the, ta do they have the tax offsets as well or is, is that just uh, Canada I'm thinking about? Yeah, probably thinking about Canada, but as an individual, right. I don't think it really matters too much. I think that the biggest thing is just that the work is abundant in New York and LA, and there's all there are always opportunities coming up where outside of there, you're probably going to be either contracting directly with like small businesses where the pay is probably not that great, and you're, you're acting as your own business and uh, representing yourself. Right, so something I find interesting about your products is they're more based towards compositing than motion design, dare I say. Um, yeah. Is, is that because you have, um, a, you are more so a compositor than a, than a motion designer? Oh yeah, I'm, I'm really, a, I don't wanna say I'm a terrible motion designer, but uh, definitely not noteworthy in any way. Like I've got like some B minus motion design skills. <laughs> Right, because for me, I, I, I started off as a compositor and the only reason I branched into motion design was because I couldn't find enough comp work. But things like character animation, it's just like, I don't even want to touch that because it's just going to look awful. I, I actually found a lot of comp work just wherever I went. I don't know why, I just... Well, you're in New York City, so that probably helps. Yeah, I mean, you're bread and butter realistically. You're just doing screen replacements all day. Like, that's what most of the, uh, the comp work is a lot of cleanup, like removing boom mics from shots, a lot of beauty work, like nothing, not like the cool stuff that most people think that they uh, want yeah. to do when they get started. Yeah, not adding the finishing touches, just doing all the, the roto, being the roto monkey, I suppose. Mm, yes. <laughs> and so how did you get from um, being a roto monkey to actually creating the tools inside After Effects that other compositors use? 
the, the idea for composite brush actually came around back when I was in college and I was trying to key a shot and I was looking at it and I was like this this should key I was doing some channel separation stuff and I was looking at this shot in all the mm -hmm. different color spaces and I was trying all the different keying tools and after effects and thinking why can't I find like some sort of streamlined streamlined way to make this key because I know these two colors are different colors there's there's a there should be a way to separate them mm -hmm. and uh, I talked to one of my friends from high school actually and I had an idea I had started writing some color separation algorithms because go figure I'm terrible at math but uh, sorry how, how did you write those algorithms was that in like a, a shader type thing or it was basically pencil and paper and uh, oh. when I started out the idea was I was looking at either the values is RGB or HSL or YCBCR and just kind of loosely explained how I thought we could pull a key. Told these ideas to my friend and uh, he helped out and helped me build a prototype for a composite brush. This was back in maybe 2011 actually. The, the prototype, was that like a pixel bender plugin or how did you go about that? The prototype was a Windows application. It was completely standalone. Oh, that sounds like more work than a plugin. <laughs> um, it wasn't, it wasn't because my friend is, uh, he, he actually doesn't want to be named on any of this stuff, but I do want to say he's basically the only reason I've made it this far. <laughs> so thank you, mysterious anonymous friend. Is he the mysterious programmer that cre that is uh, writing the code for all your apps, uh, plugins rather? Not anymore, but he was uh, very helpful along the way. But yeah, so we built the prototype as a standalone and then I started basically pitching that around and saying, hey, like I think this keyer is going to blow away any of the keyers out there. I didn't care if it was Primat or Keylight or whatever it was. Like I was basically not quite reverse engineering, but evaluating shot by shot my tool versus all of theirs. And I thought that I could find ways to improve on them. Right, so, so you think um, the your composite brush um, is better on average than, than even Primat or, or Keylight? You know, at the time I definitely did. <laughs> oh, okay, interesting. And, uh, <laughs> and and now now I really know and understand a lot about it. And I think what I wanna say is, I do think that Composite Brush will perform better in more situations, but mm -hmm. my understanding of all this stuff is so much better now that uh, I'd probably say that no keyer is better in every situation. Yeah, that's right, because half the shots I end up using Keylight, half I use Primat because, I don't know, just it just some seem to perform better in some shots and you don't question it, you're just trying to get the best result. Yeah, yeah, I mean, every keyer is basically, actually, I'm not gonna go into, I was gonna go off on a tangent there and it's totally not necessary. Oh, you can, uh, let's nerd out. <laughs> I guess the easiest way to, that you could maybe decide how two keyers are different from each other is look at which color space they work in. And just by switching the color space, that changes the relationship between any two given colors. And you could talk for days on end about which color space would be more advantageous to pull a key in, never mind the actual algorithm that's being used. So it's, it's totally, you'll never have one keyer that's gonna be better in every single situation. And actually sometimes, uh, depending on the situation, I might use key light. Uh, right. You know, 99% of the time I'm going to use composite brush, but there might be a situation where if the green is just 100% perfect flat green, uh, key light is built under the expectation that you have a flawless green screen, and that's an easy right. way to pull a key. Now granted, I think that our hair mode is still gonna get way more detail than uh, that is. I wonder, um, is, is Keylight really being worked on these days? Because that might be, um, I know it's like After Effects uh, has it licensed, but I don't feel like it's getting much in the way of updates. No, I mean, as far as I understand, Keylight is doing some very basic color different stuff where it's looking at the, the green channel versus the combination of the red and the blue channel. And that stuff has been pretty figured out for a long time. I actually don't even know which color space Keylight works in, not that it really matters, but I feel like they don't have a reason to update it because it just has a very simple chrominance evaluation, just looking at the uh, the difference between the chrominance of a color and a pixel. 
Right, uh, and as a, a product developer, you've got to keep an eye on your competition just to see like, um, you know, oh, have they released some updates in response to your, your product, which is probably, I don't know, it might've put some pressure on them, but I imagine they've already made so much money from Key Light that they're probably off on a tropical island somewhere enjoying their retirement. I think that keying in general, uh, no one really cares about getting into that market and getting competitive in that market, at least for um, at least for keying in post. Keying on set, that's still a thing because you can always key faster and we have 4K video and God help right. us, we have 8K video, but uh, yeah, I don't think anyone is paying attention to actually keying because everyone already has a workflow and a pipeline and even if you could get more efficient with keying, the future is probably more automating rotoscoping than actually figuring out color differences just because there's so many keyers and there's, right. there's no real way to go to go vastly superior to all of them. As we had been discussing, you know, you never know which is going to be the best for a given shot. So I don't think anyone's even trying anymore. It's more just about roto and tracking. Right. I can tell you that some people are trying. I've heard of some developers releasing some cool new keyers, so we'll see. But I... I, I... I guess you're right, the, the market is quite mature at this stage because, you know, keying is quite an old process and... Tough to improve. Again, I'm not going to get too in, into the uh, into the bones of what, what a key is and how they differ from each other, but I'd say at this point, we've gotten so close. When it comes to just pulling a color separation algorithm, almost everything has been done.